All right, I want to uh, thank Nathan and Soas and Ada for bringing me here today. And thank you all for coming to listen to me. Um, I practiced this talk, and it's kind of, it might be a little bit long, so I hope you're, you're patient with me. Um, looking through my notes, I remember that I gave a somewhat uh, similar talk a few years ago in 2016 at a, a workshop in Chiang Mai, and I called it Linguistic Evidence for Ethnic Origins in Search of the Unfindable. And what had brought about that talk and what also is sort of motivating this talk is that a colleague at the University of Zurich at that time had asked me, what is all the evidence for the, what, is, what is the earliest evidence for the Burmese language and the Burmese people? And uh, when he asked me this, I kind of groaned because I thought, all right, here we go again. You know, we're going to have to look at the old colonial era scholars to find answers to these questions, which are not easy to answer. Uh, oh. shall, do, shall I? Push um, I, what do you want to do? I can do it myself. It's fine. Yeah. I, don't, I don't have that many, I don't have that many slides. Yeah, and it's going to be a while before I get to the next slide. Um, <coughs> and that, that question, and, you know, his, my colleague's question and then this question of the origins of the Burmese and the Burmans brought me to Luce because he is one of the few people who have actually addressed this question of where did the Burmans come from and what, did, what, where are, their, what are their origins. Um, so again, I, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that talk. Uh, I found, you know, I found there was a lot to say about origins, about migrations, um, and then it struck me how important this idea of the migration has been in historiography, both inside Burma and outside Burma and in Southeast Asia in general. Um, you'll find, for example, whether we're talking about the Burmans, also known as the Burmese, uh, the ethnic majority, or some of the other ethnic minority groups of Burma, they will often say, oh yes, we came from somewhere else. We came from China, we came from Mongolia, we came from Central Asia. So in 2016, one of the themes that I had wanted to develop was how linguistics and history often inform each other, but they can also misinform each other because scholars in one discipline don't necessarily understand how the scholarship in the other discipline works or changes that have occurred in re more recent decades. And I see this all the time on both sides. I won't name any names, but there are some real guilty parties out there. Um, the most important point I was trying to make at that point was that origins, in the sense that my colleague was asking, <coughs> and in the sense that a lot of people want to know, is not something uh, that we can really answer easily. Uh, it's ultimately a political question, one that the evidence from history and linguistics alone cannot prove or disprove, but it can only give us ideas which nationalists, in the sense of nationally minded historians or intellectuals, can then decide is a point of origin or not. If, I hope that makes sense. And if it doesn't, I'm, I'm going to come back to that theme. So at that talk, I was talking to a bunch of hardcore linguists who maybe weren't so sympathetic to my line of reasoning and also maybe didn't really understand what I was going on about. Um, their, the reaction of that audience was kind of summed up by a Vietnamese, a specialist of the Vietnamese language who said, oh, I always make sure to show my uh, work to historians first, so I know that it's right. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, today I have a bit more time for me to talk, and uh, I'm also going to be able to focus more on mm -hmm. Luce himself and his ideas. And I think it's really important that we talk about people like Luce and some of these other early scholars whose work is really foundational, not only to Burmese studies, Burma studies, which we're talking about today, um, but more generally in Southeast Asian studies across the board in Indian, you know, today what we call Indonesia or Thailand or Cambodia, Vietnam, there's a lot of this early scholarship from early European um, yeah, scholars who really set the tone for how we see these countries and places. And we haven't necessarily, especially in Burma, gone back to their work and, and seen whether it still stands up um, to more recent developments. So today I'm going to talk about uh, Luce, the trope of migration. I'm going to uh, spend some time talking about the larger pardon me, uh, context in which British scholars were writing, with Luce being a really good uh, representative of uh, a whole generation of scholars. 
I'll talk about the actual idea of migration and what it does, why it's useful, why people like to talk about migration, or at least used to. Then I'll step back a minute and, and spend a little bit of time sort of historicizing or critiquing some of Luce's ideas and other ideas of that time. And finally, I'll, um, I have a few interesting examples of how uh, intellectuals and scholars in Burma today still very much make reference to the idea of migration. All right, so let's dive in. Um, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about the the larger context. So when Luce was active, I, I want to talk about what was going on in Britain and Europe and what had what had gone on before Luce even got here. Um, Burma was a colony of. Uh, Britain from 1824 to 1947, and the British were coming from India. So the British, you know, the British, uh, this mean when I say the British, it's a shorthand for uh, colonial administrators, for scholars, for other people involved in the, in the machinery of colonialism. Um, they brought with them new concepts, new practices, and new technologies of governance uh, to Burma. Also at the same time, in Europe, or we could maybe say the Western experience, there were new ideas and new ways of looking at the world that were developing. <coughs> so just one really good example is Darwinism. Uh, the idea of the survival of the fittest, that you know, certain species survived because they were better adapted than others. So an offshoot of this in the 19th century was the idea of social Darwinism. The idea that uh, certain people, certain cultures, certain civilizations were inherently stronger or superior and more fit to rule than others. Um, another thing, I think another important development in the 18th and 19th century um, was an ongoing political development um, that you could say is the, a move away from seemingly irrational forms of government or political arrangements, um, like the empire in the, in the European sense, uh, into the rational ideal of the nation state. So when I say empire, I'm, I'm speaking here specifically of things like, you know, further in the past, the Holy Roman Empire, or uh, more contemporary with that time, you know, the Ottoman Empire, um, the Prussia, do we have Prussia then already? But this idea that, or the Austro-Hungarian Empire, that's what I mean. So the idea that under one kingdom, under one emperor, you would have many languages, many peoples, and all sort of mixed up. And so the ideal was, uh, un under, the, under um, the idea of romantic nationalism, just let's say nationalism, the sort of national awakening, awakening, is that you have this idea, ideal new form of the nation state in which there's one people, one culture, one language. And um, that ideal, as if we don't have to think very much to realize how much political violence was committed in the 20th century in, in the name of trying to create this kind of nation state. Um, now, interestingly, at the same time that, 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 that in Europe, at least Western Europe, people were fighting against that idea of empire, they were also actively going out in uh, places all throughout the world to establish the British Empire, the French Empire, and etc. And when the British take over the territory of what would become Burma, which really wasn't called Burma yet at that time, I'll get into that, they were also taking over a kingdom that had a lot of similarities with an empire. You know, you had the center in Mandalay and it had control, often very loose, over a great variety of peoples and cultures, languages, all that stuff. So when the British got to Burma, I keep wanting to say here because I think I'm still in Burma, <laughs> uh, they wanted to make sense of what they found, the people and the place itself. Now in India, they could classify people based on religion and caste. Classifying them this way was very useful. It told them, uh, it told administrators who was civilized uh, or the level of civilization they had and it also said something about, you know, once you have these classifications, it also said something about where in the colonial machinery you could put people. So um, you could also figure out uh, who would be taxed and who would be useful in serving in the government. So for example, uh, Bengalis were often put into the civil service, as you find uh, a lot of Bengalis going into Burma and doing that. 
um, tribal people, like in, today we would <coughs> say in Northeast India or some of the other tribal people in um, Central India, were kind of to be left alone because they weren't that civilized. And then the uh, people like the Gurkhas were to serve in the armies. So, um, oh, and also the British administrators in India had gotten very interested in history, and here I'll use the, square, the scare quotes, the idea of history as we understand it today, uh, which is, means something like the establishing of truth and the facts. And their interest in, in India in getting uh, in history was often to resolve conflicting claims for land ownership, which meant the more you study history, the more you could understand taxation. Anyway, uh, so when the British arrived in Burma, they found that religion and caste were not useful in a country where there was no caste, and uh, most people at that time were Buddhist or animist or some combination of the two. So with the the, the practice of governments that, governance that the British introduced was to classify people by language, which, so language became a proxy, an indicator of the idea of race at the time. And race is something which now has largely been replaced by the word ethnicity outside of the country. Uh, but in Burma today, people still often, when speaking English, they still often use this word race. And I, I want to make a point here that I, I, I suspect to an English-speaking audience, this seems normal and natural that language would equal ethnicity or race, but it actually isn't. It's a, a, a particular, you, you find the association particularly strong in the English-speaking world. It's less strong, for example, as I understand in French scholarship and some, um, some other intellectual traditions. Um, and I, I'm, I will come back to the idea of race and go into that more. The other thing that the British did is that they uh, took over control of writing the past for Burma and its interpretation. So the past and history were taken out of the hands of the Burmese courts, which was one of the traditional sites where histories were written, and also to a degree out of the hands of monks, because monks were also uh, interested in relating, re, uh, uh, recording religious histories. So, to use a, a modern phrase, uh, the Burmese were no longer in control of the narrative over their own past. So a new dynamic was set up. The British, which included, here I'm using, I'm, uh, I'm going across several decades when I mention these names. This included people like Blagden, like Harvey, like Hall, Furnival, Luce, and, and some others, were often dependent upon local people, local interlocutors, to help them with the reading and the interpretation of sources, um, especially those that were not in Burmese, those could be in Mon, or as we'll see, uh, with, in Luce's case, also Chinese. Um, although, as Carol has pointed out, he, he did study Chinese. But then on the other hand, the Burmese themselves would take on much of the, idea, the British ideas and practices through uh, a uh, of dealing with history, which they had learned through exposure to colonial institutions of learning, so schools. So the British would come in, they, they set up the story, and then through schools, the, the Burmese would internalize these new ways, these new ideas about their own history, and new ways of looking at their own past. Um, most importantly, the British brought in a new kind of history. So of course there's always been history in Burma, but uh, the British brought in a very particular conception of history as the pursuit of facts and the truth, again, the scare quotes. Um, the idea of we're going to study to find out what really happened through a scientific reading of the past, whether it was artifacts or sources. Um, so British scholars, and, and I should say Burmese scholars trained in the British tradition, uh, looked at Burmese sources and found them wanting. They were unreliable. They didn't tell the truth. They were all mixed up. And, and Carol men uh, mentioned um, Harry Shorto, who taught here at SOAS, and he was, uh, his specialty was uh, Mon language and Mon sources. And he has this, this essay that was published in a volume dedicated to Hull, where he says, you know, these Mon sources, they're pretty unreliable. They're pretty, pretty useless. Um, as part of this process, there was also, uh, people started to divide history into genres. So this is, this is a really simple point. Uh, 
Whereas history writing might be this sort of big overall field in a place like Burma, pre-colonial Burma, pre-colonial Siam, all those places. Now it was divided into you know, proper history, then literature, then myth and legend. This is where you put all that stuff that was in the chronicles, which was not the truth. And a point, um, this is a bit abstract, but I think this is a, an important point to understanding what Luce is trying to do. Um, in doing, in, in this, throughout this whole process, what the British were essentially doing was creating new subjects or objects of study. And I should point out, it wasn't just British scholars, but it was also people like those, uh, the administrators who were doing things like conducting censuses, where they were trying to figure out all the different people living in the country by giving their languages names. So what do I mean by that? Well, we can understand uh, something as an object of study, right? Um, <coughs> I, I don't mean to get too precious here with the linguistic terminology. But you can think of, you know, what are people studying? Oh, I am studying Burmese history. I am studying Burma. I am studying this ethnic group. I'm studying that ethnic group. So they became objects of study. But these, uh, they also became subjects in a more literal sense. You find in uh, English language histories, and then later on in Burmese histories, that these new subjects, so I'm talking here about the Mons, the Burmans, the Bu became actual subjects of sentences. <coughs> the Mons did this, the Burmans did that. If you look at a pre-modern Burmese or Mons source, they never talk like that. They talk about very specific people, they talk about forces, they talk about personalities, but they don't talk about races, they don't talk about, uh, they generally don't talk about countries in the sense that we understand them today. Um, Right, and so I will, I'll spend more time a little bit later talking about uh, the, the racial categories, but I, the most important point right now is that these new uh, subjects were created, and so there were new categories of thought when people were looking at Burma and the Burmese past. So this is the intellectual inheritance, or a big part of it, that Luce, Luce had when he came here. So as Carol, you know, Carol mentioned and also here, not only here, but in her book, she goes into great detail. She didn't give a plug for her book, but I will. Um, Luce, as, as, as Carol indicated, Luce was fascinated by Burma. And as we would say in, in where I come from, he was like a kid in the candy store. Uh, he was interested in everything and tried his hand at all different kinds of uh, disciplines, topics, whatever you, you want to call it. So he, he wrote related to history, related to philology, historical linguistics, art history, archaeology everything. Um, as far as I know, he was fairly dependent on working with local scholars. Um, my understanding is that he could not speak Burmese or not speak it very well. This is not from me, but this comes from Michael Antoine, who had gone to meet him in the 70s before he died, and he said he wasn't really able to have a conversation. Um, but I do understand that he could read it, and he, and he could probably read Mon. He studied Chinese, but I also know that for his work on the, the Manchu, which I will get into in a moment, uh, I think he also had to work closely with some uh, Chinese speakers. And as we know, as, as Carol told us, told us he worked uh, closely with Pei Mang Din and even married his sister. So, Luce, you know, since Luce was looking at so many things, <clears throat> all these disciplines and spheres of competence informed each other. So that means that his observations in art history or archaeology would inform his ideas of linguistic interpretation, which informed his thinking about history. I'm just going to have a little swallow of water. Mm -hmm. you don't mind. <clears throat> All right, to return to a theme that I, I brought up in the beginning, <clears throat> Luce was looking for origins. Um, this is what the British and other Europeans were doing in the rest of the world uh, when they would go off into their colonies. They were asking themselves, at least the intellectually inclined were, uh, where did these people come from? Um, and this was especially important in places where the, the Europeans thought that, that the, um, this, the, the new subjects had no history. You know, they didn't have a lot of sources, they didn't have any inscriptions. This is true in Burma, it's still true today. That there's this, you know, uh, that people like the Kachins or the Karins don't have history because they don't have 
lots of um, old manuscripts. Also, we have to keep in mind that Burmese sources didn't talk about origins in the way that the British were interested in. So sources here, I, I've used that word a couple times now, I, it generally means something like the court-sponsored chronicles. Um, and these chronicles, which were written, you know, there are lots of them and they were, they were written over uh, several centuries and they, they're often, um, they cite each other quite a bit. There's a lot of intertextuality, as they say. Um, they talk about lineages and precedents of kingdoms, you know, what was the earliest, uh, when, uh, what is the connection between this kingdom and another kingdom, what's the connection between this royal line and that royal line, and they talk a lot about the sasana, which is a, wor is, uh, a word I will use because I think it's important because um, that's the precursor to what we now call, since the 19th century, Buddhism. But at the time, there wasn't, if you look at the sources, they don't really use this word, anything like Buddhism or the Burmese or Mon equivalent. They're talking about the, the Thalana, the, the, the Sasana. And of course, the sources themselves were not static. They developed over time. Uh, kings and courts would, would want to rewrite them and have them um, have uh, mistakes removed in a, in a process of purification, which is my word, uh, very similar to the, the, the purification of, 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 of Buddhism or the sasana that happened periodically. Um, so, let's see. So to the extent that the Burmese sources talk about origins, they say that the Gaon <laughs> was the first Burmese kingdom. And, um, right. Luce didn't like that idea. Um, something else that I learned recently, which I think is really fascinating, is in the 19th century, there was this assumption that the world was not that old. Uh, this, is, this comes from a biblical perspective. Uh, the world had only been around for a few thousand years, so how do we account for the great diversity of people and languages we find all across the planet? You know, there's a great diversity of physical appearances. I'm not saying that Luce or any in fact, any of these uh, British scholars who I've mentioned necessarily believe that in a biblical sense, but this is sort of an idea in the air. So one way to understand why there's such great diversity is, is uh, that people migrated from somewhere else. And if you think about this, um, something else that was going on at the time was um, a great interest in the Indo-European languages, you know, English and um, all the languages that are spoken, most of the languages spoken in Europe, and in, in, in the time before the Age of Discovery, we were spoken all the way from Iceland to Bengal. Um, so the idea is there with the Indo-European languages is that there was a great migration, and that's how we understand, that's why there's such a widespread, uh, there's such a large swath of the planet that was covered with these speakers. And it also related to that is the idea of the Urheimat, that there was this homeland somewhere where they all moved out from in this great migration. And um, if any of you are familiar with Indian history, this is a, this is a central trope uh, in Indian history that the Indo-European speakers, the Indo-Aryans, uh, as they were called there, moved in, in in great mass and pushed the Dravidians out into the, into the southern part of the uh, South Asia. And also, uh, migration was central to con contemporaneous European historiography. Um, we know that they, there's this idea of the period of migration, the idea of Germanic-speaking people somewhere between the 4th and the 6th century, which uh, caused the downfall of the Roman Empire. So again, migration was this idea that's in the air. So, oh, here, my first slide. Um, this, this is a, these are some of, oh, there's actually two slides. These are some of the... Um, <laughs> Luce, uh, in which Luce talked about the idea of migration. Um, this is not an exhaustive list. Um, but as you can see, let's see, 1953 to 1965, actually, some, as, as I'll get into, this one, Old Jose and the Coming of the Bourbons, he started thinking about this in the 30s. So migration was something that he spent uh, migration origins was something he spent several decades thinking about. 
So when Lou starts writing, first of all, he takes certain things as given. It's a given that Burma is this place, it's a site, it's a subject. And Burma specifically, as we understand it today, this country that, is, that is, uh, has these international dem demarcated borders. Um, and he also takes as given the so-called historical races, the Mons, the Burmans, the Shans, the Bu. And historical, again, means that, uh, I mean in the sense that they have historical records to support their existence. Uh, these are, this is opposed to people uh, who don't have uh, that, those kind of records, like the Kachins or the, uh, the Chin and the Karin. Um, and I think Luce was, was wanted to create a national history. And I mean this in two senses. First of all, in the sense of a history for all of Burma. Um, I don't think he, I'm not sure if he ever said this explicitly, and I don't think he had as explicit a project as someone, say, as Harvey did, who very much wanted to write uh, narratives which uh, Burmese schoolboys would read uh, in readers and things like that. Um, and again, so he's, he's looking for answers to the questions of how and when the various people, these various historical races, appeared in Burma. And the answer and the methodology that he employed to get these answers differed a, a little bit for each of the uh, groups that he talks about, which I'll get into in a moment. Um, and as I said, local sources do not talk about origins or don't answer these kinds of questions that he wanted to know. So in order to get the answers, what he did was, first, one of his main strategies was to look at language. So language is, you know, language is a way to classify people, but it was also a way to understand the past. So he would look for shared words and loan words. And in his thinking, not unreasonably, loan words can indicate uh, who arrived in Burma first, with the idea that people who came in later, and often were at a lower stage of civilization when they came in, would borrow words from those who were there first or earlier. And this can all, this, these, um, these, these borrowings can tell you about food, they can tell you about agriculture, but they can also tell you about things like uh, the level of cultural development, about art and architecture. And this other strategy, Luce's other strategy when he was, when he was trying to re reconstruct this past was to look at Chinese sources, um, with, uh, especially this one called the Manchu, which I will get into in just a second. So I'm gonna I spend a little bit of time talking specifically about uh, the article Old Chao Se and the Coming of the Burmans, and then I'll make reference to uh, a, f a few other articles that he wrote. So this uh, Old Chao Se and the Coming of the Burmans, Luce wrote in the 1950s, but was based on ideas that he had been knocking around since the 1930s. Um, and again, this is, as far as I know, really the only piece of scholarship that I've seen that really addresses, by anybody, that really addresses this question of where do the Burmans come from, where did their language come from. Um, Luce points out in this article that there is this period for which we don't have good evidence. So Burmese writing only appears in the 11th century, but as I understand, uh, art archaeological, uh, sorry, art historical and archaeological evidence points that Pagan and places like that were al already established in the 9th century. So there's about this period, Luce was saying, uh, from the 9th to the 11th century that we don't have uh, Burmese sources to tell us what was going on. So he made extensive use of this, uh, the Manchu, which means something like the Book of the Southern Barbarians, which was written in the ninth century uh, by Fan Chuo. I don't know how you say that. Um, and it's a description of, of the Nanchao Kingdom and the people associated with it uh, and their neighbors. Now, Nanchao, um, oh, this didn't come up very well. So this is Burma here. Nam Chao is up north of Kunming in what is Yunnan, so it's not that far away. Um, now, scholarship on, on Nam Chao has changed in the past decades, but the idea is that 
you have this kingdom up there from the 8th to the 9th century that was ruled by people who were probably related to either the Bai people or the Yi people. And the Yi are still a, a very large na nationality in um, Yunnan and parts of southern China. And uh, their language is somewhat related to, uh, it's related to Burmese, but uh, yeah, it's not very close, but close enough. And there's this idea that under this kingdom, there were many people, many different ethnic groups, very uh, different uh, speakers of different languages who were associated with it. Um, maybe they were under the, the control of Nan Chao, maybe they were sort of mercenaries for Nan Chao. So Luce reads the Manchu as providing information about what he calls the proto burmans They were one of the peoples that uh, he says were living around Nan Chao. And he ends up reading uh, sections of the text and decides that some of the words that he finds in it are actually Burmese words. Um, so for example, man, uh, he reads as uh, being the same word which in modern Burmese we pronou is pronounced mean, but we know that several hundred years ago was pronounced man before some sound changes of modern Burmese. And, um, okay, uh, We'll look at that text in a minute. His idea was that um, we know that Nan Chao attacked the few city-states of Lower Burma. And so he thinks the proto-Burmans went along on these attacks, knew how to get to uh, the, the Irrawaddy Valley. So when Nan Chao finally collapsed in the ninth century, uh, they decided to be free of their, co of their masters who uh, Lu says they hate it because they wish to be free of the Nancho Chao Yo. What I find, oh, here, let's look at this. So, um, we, if we read this description, um, uh, they live in multi storied houses without city walls, sometimes painting their teeth, they dress in untreated cloth. Um, it's, it sounds very much like something Southeast Asian, right? Um, from a thousand years ago, whether this is what Burmese people were doing or looked like, we don't know. But it's, it's you know, you read this and, and, and uh, Luce, Luce wasn't pulling something out of thin air, right? I think there is something suggestive about some of these descriptions. Um, what's fascinating about Luce's article is that he provides an extremely detailed um, path, geographic path, that, the, that he thinks the um, these proto burmans took all the way up from Nan Chao down to Chao Se. No, is there, Nan, is there a pointer or something? There's no pointer. Um, I apologize, this isn't the best map, but from what I can work out, basically they came, he thinks that the, the proto burmans lived between this, um, what's it called? The Namai Ka River, which is up up near Michina, and between there and the, the Mekong. So it's somewhere up here. And then they came down, he, he has the exact, he has the exact path uh, mapped out. Either they go through this pass, they go through that pass, they go through Siba, they cross the Migne, uh, here, then at uh, Laksok, they turn down this way, and then, let's see, where's Mandalay? So at some point, they end up around here, and then they get spit out on this end, and so they, they end up at Jose. And as I recall, the ground is actually north of here somewhere. That was the original idea that the that Burmese sources talk about. But he's saying, no, this is where the, um, the proto burmans popped out. So, um, <coughs> ooh, sorry, I'm back to that minute. Um, and just, just to complete the picture of uh, what Luce was doing when he was talking about migration, um, he, when he talked about some of the other ethnic groups, he also read uh, the Yuanxi, A History of the Mongol Rule in China, and that was a particularly important source for his, dis his discussions of the Shans. He had a, a lengthy two-part article from 1958 and 1959 called The Early Siam in, uh, or Shan, in Burma's history, and um, he also he also argues they were up there in Yunnan, and they he he worked out a path that they 
took from Yunnan into um, Burma. And similarly for the Mons, he had a, a slightly more complicated, elaborate um, theory, uh, a civilizational theory that the Mons were part of the development of white, of red, sorry, wet rice agriculture. And um, you know, he argued that uh, in, until a, a particular ethnic group developed wet rice agriculture, they weren't very civilized, and the Mons crossed that barrier, the, or the Rubicon, as he called it, fairly early on. And so then he was, um, if, unless you crossed the Rubicon, you, you never made it to this higher level, something like that. Um, so he traced, in, in, he, in, the, in this article, he compares lots of um, vocabulary lists from various languages of Burma, and, and so, he, he, he argues that the Mons were there first in Burma and that all these later groups uh, uh, adopted vocabulary from them. Um, all right, so this is the point where I will step back for a moment and um, think about, well, how, how do some of Luce's ideas um, hold up to more recent scholarship? Um, and I'm not the first to do to do this. One of the first, uh, a, a more recent uh, attempt to sort of uh, historicize or critique some of Luce's arguments were in Michael Ongdwin's 2005 work, The Mists of Ramanya. Um, but that book wasn't very well received in a lot of quarters. Uh, and I, I would also point out, as I think I've said before, within Burma, Luce's ideas are still very important and often uh, un not at all critically accepted. I'm sorry, not treated to any sort of um, critique. And this, that's especially true outside of academia. So people still, still quote him. Um, and I wanted to point out that this is true also uh, in international scholarship. There's somebody, I think it was either Randy LaPala or David Bradley who um, quoted this, this elaborate um, path, pathway of the proto-Burmans from Yunnan into um, the area of central Burma that I was mentioning. Um, if any of you know who that is, I don't know if John knows <coughs> who that is, I can't remember which article it is. I've been quoting it now for a couple of years and I don't I have to look it up. All right, so um, I just have a few points. The first, the, the idea of migration is itself, in more recent scholarship has talked about, <coughs> um, has, has brought some new ideas of understanding migration. Um, Luce and many other people were understanding migration as large numbers of people moving in sort of hordes across the plains. Um, another idea, to, uh, more recent scholarship has talked about um, the idea of elite replacement, or sorry, elite spread. And for ex a good example of this is modern day Turkey or Anatolia. And what happened in Turkey is that a small elite group came to sit upon a conquered population. So Turks, Turk, uh, speakers of a variety of, of, of Turkish speech came from Central Asia and uh, to, to Anatolia. So the genetic profile of most modern Turks shows that only a small amount of their DNA came from Central Asia and that most of the people are Anatolian. In other words, the language moved, but most of the people didn't. So closer to home in Vietnam and Laos, uh, a French anthropologist, Georges Codemines, uh, studied the relations between Thai speakers, or Thai speakers, the speakers of the Thai languages, white Thai, black Thai, languages like that, and Austroasiatic speakers. And so Austroasiatic includes languages like Vietnamese, Mon, Khmer, but he was studying specifically many of these uh, upland people, very small groups. And he found that the, the, the Thai languages, including, I think, Shan, um, spread because of, in part, primogenitor. So we have this in, in I think, Anglo-Saxon history, uh, the idea that the eldest son inherits everything and all the other sons get nothing. So they are encouraged to move out. So in the context of, of upland uh, Southeast Asia, uh, you would get, you would get uh, small bands of people moving to settle new valleys where they could um, start wet rice agriculture. So what happens is, just as I was describing with the Turks, you get a small elite sitting on top of another population who over time 
adopt the language of their conquerors. And this is a process that you could still observe in the 20th century. And this is, this is George Condominas himself. Um, I love this picture because I think it represents a particular moment in anthropology. I'm not trying to make fun of him, but it was, it was really a way of you know, sort of participatory research. He himself, I think, was of uh, partial French, Portuguese, and Vietnamese mixed ancestry. And he was very famous. I think he only, he only died fairly recently. Um, so I just <coughs> want to say that there, there's other ways of understanding how language moves than just this idea of the mass migration. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was uh, Chinese sources. Now, I'm not an expert. Nathan can tell us <coughs> more about Nathan. Nathan, Nathan. He can tell us more about um, Middle Chinese and the reconstruction of Middle Chinese. Um, it's a little, it's a slightly complicated discussion, but if you look at, um, the Manchu is written in Middle Chinese, right? Which doesn't sound like modern Chinese does. And if you understand, as we do now, more about the reconstruction of Middle Chinese, you can understand, you can get a clearer sense of the kinds of sounds they were trying to represent at the time. So foreign place names would often be represented in these texts. And um, even though we've got a better understanding of what these things sound like, you can still see that Luce was just, there was a lot of conjecture in what he was saying. You know, oh, when they mention these people, when they mention those people, those are clearly the Mons, or they're clearly the Khmers, or something like that. It's not at all that simple. Um, and as, as uh, this, this text, this quote, which I can go back to for a second, suggests, um, we have to keep in mind that Chinese sources are written from a Chinese perspective. What does that mean? Well, the Chinese saw themselves as central, superior, civilized, the center of the universe. And they're talking about these barbarians who are wild, uncivilized, dangerous, threatening, living at the periphery of their kingdom. Um, and there are all kinds of texts, not just the Manchu, but the Chinese wrote all kinds of texts about their, their uh, people who lived on their frontiers. So, for example, the Manchu can be extremely detailed. It can give you seemingly precise descriptions of clothing, of hairstyles, of ornaments, you know. Um, yeah, here we get something about the painting of their teeth. And then it can be extremely vague about, um, you know, places and times. And it, and it gives, the names that they give you are based on uh, Chinese perceptions. Oh, it's the white, the people who wore white clothes, it's the people who wore dark clothes. It doesn't say what they themselves call themselves, if that makes sense. Um, so, I mean, on the other hand, it's, it's, it's clear that the, the, the linguistic descendants of the peoples that the Manchu were talking about are still in the area today. Um, I, think, I think a good analogy might be is if we looked at Roman descriptions of Germanic tribes along the Danube or Celtic tribes in Gaul, we know there's a connection, but we can't say, oh, look, they were talking about the French. They were talking about the Germans. You see what I'm saying? I think it's, it's a very similar leap that Luce was making. I think, do I have some visuals? Yes, so this is, this is, the, this is the way that uh, these people would be, that this Chinese scroll from uh, somewhere in the 19th, ninth, sorry, the 19th century uh, would just, um, represent people from the southern frontier. I mean, you could sort of see some similarities, but then to say that's the same as a young woman today, I mean, it's just not possible. Um, the last main section I wanted to talk about has to do with the idea of race, which I've talked about before. Um, but I think it's, it's important to understand how race as a construction has really influenced, well, it was really influencing what Luce was doing, but it's also one of the places that um, things can sort of fall apart, can come apart if we understand, um, if we can contextualize it better. So, I think how I, how people identify, how they understand themselves, um, changes over time. It's not a given. Um, and I think if, 
All right, let's start again. Lewis was following British ideas, and so he was talking about language as indicating race, okay? So where there's evidence of a language, he, he argues, we can know the people. But I think that's only true in a more limited sense. We can know about a lineage, or we can know about an ancestors, like I was just explaining here. <coughs> but the question of when this woman became what she is now, and who decides that point, it was in 1850, no, it was in, six, it was in the 6th century, no, it was in 1572, that's a political question. So to make that clear, let me, let's, let's think about how, or let's think about what we understand about how people understood themselves and difference and community and identity before the colonial era. And this is not just true in Burma, but it's true in a lot of places. So, ideas and practices varied a lot. Um, people understood themselves in terms of kinship, in terms of political allegiance, which could mean ties of loyalty, ties of submission. Um, it could be in terms of religious affiliation. It could be in terms of geography, the people who lived here. Um, people's identities were often contingent. They were contextual, especially when people are multilingual. So that means that in one context, you might identify yourself one way, but when you're speaking another language or talking to other people, you might also identify with them. Um, also, there was a total ecosystem of identities so that um, they were often relational. So what do I mean by this? Uh, we can still see this today, in, in, or see this in, in, until the recent past in Burma, you have, Leach talked about uh, the, the Kachins and the Shans and how in certain circumstances the one could become the other. But we could also understand that they understood themselves in relation to that other. Oh, we are the people who do this, but they are the people who do that. We wear this, they wear that. They live, they live there, we live here. Um, they raise that kind of rice, we do this kind of agriculture. Um, they do that religious practice, we do this religious practice. So it's very much, it's not just uh, a singular unit understanding themselves as sort of existing in a void, but always in relation to other groups and other people. Now, if that isn't quite making sense, think of it this way. Let's look at what, how race and uh, ethnicity work today. Ideally, people have a united single identity. There is one per people. There is the Mons, the Burmans. They speak one language, they have a common history, they have common ancestors, and they should have unique cultural practices, ideally not shared with any other group. They ideally should live in a one territory, and, and there shouldn't be other people in that territory. So it's a coherent entity, and it's essentialist. There's some sort of essential spirit to be a member of this group. Now, it doesn't take any thought to realize that that really doesn't work in Burma, or actually most of the world outside of a limited part of Western Europe, people are just so mixed together. Um, and I would just point out that the, what we see in Burma today is that these two different ways, or two different schemes, are, in, are, are sort of in tension with each other, that you've got sort of the ideological idea that, you know, we Burmans, we Mons, we Shans, we whoever, uh, should all, all be separate and um, not mixed, for example, not mixed with other races against um, these older practices. All right, so in the, the final section I just want to talk about, um, some of the, I just wanted to show a few examples of ways that the idea of mi migration still has a lot of influence uh, in local um, intellectual contexts. Um, <laughs> Migration is really well established in local self-understandings. Um, for example, in, in writings among uh, Mon, Shan, Chin, Rakhine intellectuals, they, they often, when they talk about their past, they often talk about um, a migration. And this is just the first page of an article that um, an amateur historian who I knew, uh, Nai Kim Le, who was the director of the Mon Cultural Museum in Malignan, wrote in, um, a Dwey Emian magazine between 2013 and 2014. And you don't need to read the Burmese or to, to even be able to see this that clearly to see that, you know, the actual title is the Mon Migration, and he uses the English word migration um, 
to describe the process. And then, and then here you can see he's, he's, he's quoting people like Luce, uh, Christy, Fully Blank, and all these, these, these uh, various sources. And he's, he's recycling a lot of uh, these ideas to make this, this very lengthy argument about where the Mons came from. And another, um, this comes from a 1993 book on the history of the Zhou people, the, the Chins. And um, he doesn't cite a source, but all these lines are, uh, if you read the text, they they're represent different ideas of mostly 19th and early 20th century scholars of uh, where, where the various ethnic groups came uh, from, which is usually Yunnan, places in China, into Burma and how they, they moved around. This is just another one. So you first, you first get the people coming way over here in Kashmir, then they're, they go through what's now Mongolia, they end up in southern China, and then from southern China they go from Yunnan and into Burma. Um, and some of the sources that they're, like I said, some of the sources they're quoting are, are, are quite old. Um, the final one is from The Races of Myanmar, um, or it's called Races of Myanmar and Ways of Migration, and this is from Sion Tong's uh, History of the Shan State from 2009. And he's just got them all in there. He's got the Proto Burmans, the Muso Lolo people, the Kachins, the Mon Khmers, and the the, the Thai Chinese, and for example, Thai Chinese, that's, that's not even, a, a, it's no longer uh, an accepted um, idea that the, that the, the Thais and the Chinese have a shared language. Um, so he's, he's basically quoting somebody f um, from 1933 to make this argument. Now, I just want to point out, um, there's a lot you could say about how Burmese intellectuals and scholars argue and how they uh, use evidence and, and what they're doing when they, when they um, present this kind of information. Um, but I think the most important thing is to, to, is to think about how they're very concerned with establishing their presence in the country from as early a time as possible to show some kind of ancient lineage, to show that they can sit at the table with the big historical races, like particularly the Burmese, but also the Shans and the Mons, and that they can claim a, uh, a, a antiquity for the people. So Sion Tun, for example, cites some very early speculations that were made in the late 19th century that the, the Shans were a race that were formed 2,000 years ago and that they'd been in the region ever since then. So in conclusion, I would just say, you know, we can think about migration as a trope. We can think about it as a reality. Um, we can think about it as an idea, as a way to understand a historical process of the spread of languages and people. But at the same time, I think it's important to separate out language and people. And locally, migration has become a crucial element following the ideas of loose that people use to understand themselves. And so I think it's actually not going to be very easy to displace it. And I, I just wanted to point out that um, it's not just in Burma that you find this. Uh, the American, uh, American anthropologist Rob, uh, Robbins Burling spent a lot of time in Northeast India amongst uh, people like the Galo and some other uh, speakers of, of tibeto burman languages. And he found that this is an extremely common question in the region, where did my tribe come from? And so he wrote this, e this essay called, where does the question, where do my people come from, come from? Why is there this notion that we all came from somewhere else? And I also want to say, you know, I, I, I may have tried to make it sound like the, the migrations aren't important. And I think that's actually not true. I just mean it in a very sort of uh, specific sense that Luce was arguing. Um, there is actually some really interesting stuff coming out of research having to do with the South China expansion. This idea that uh, maybe around 2,000 years ago in Southern China, uh, many of the, the ethnic groups, the la uh, sorry, the languages that are spoken in Southeast Asia were originally spoken there, but they were pushed out with Han expansion. Uh, all right, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. So thank you very much.